special events, not for the format, but uh, thanks to our Italian speaker, Beppe Severnini. for all Italians living abroad. So uh, I'm, for me it's a great pleasure to have uh, Severini with us uh, today. And of course, I wish also to thank uh, Daniel Franklin. Uh, uh, Daniel, I hope that in the future we become a friend of the Institute exactly like John. So thank you for accepting me. Uh, I don't want to take much of your time and over to the speaker, but I remind you that after, as usual, after the discussion, we offer a drink and refreshment. Upstairs, of course, you are invited. So I give the, our speaker a little to, to speak, and thank you for coming. Before we begin, there is something I want to clarify. One, two, three, four, five, six seats with a reserve and no one sitting. That's very Italian. That's very Italian, yes. <laughs> for, they are for the autorità. So, no, you. Five people can sit. Five people. One, two, three, four, five, six people can sit. Please. You can sit in the front if you're bored, you can go away, I won't. <laughs> Two more. Okay, good. And also, there is a, a reader of mine who wrote and complained because all the seats were gone and she said I know that there is some Italian uh, way of giving out seats but I said no it's fair it was very it was fair the first come first serve and uh, but I said but since you, you don't trust me you can come as my special guest I don't know where she is but she has to be brave enough to say I was the one who done are you there ciao well, <laughs> Seriously, uh, I'm extremely happy to be here. London is almost my professional hometown together with Milan. And I'm very pleased to have two friends and exceptional colleagues. And I use this word with extreme care. In Italian, everybody now is straordinario. Straordinario is the word of the century now. But they are really extraordinary. <coughs> uh, for for a long time, and uh, one of the still writes for the FT now is, is in Oxford enjoying himself more. Mm -hmm. and, and Daniel Frank, who, who grabbed me and sort of brought me into the economist world back in the early 90s, and we're, the three of us were here in 99, 70 years ago, talking about the different book Italian City Because we know each other well and they know how good they are, this won't be like a one man show because it will be ridiculous. And then, of course, there will be. It, you know, either one could have a good one man show, not me. So we're going to be a real discussion among three people who know each other well, but we haven't prepared what we want to do. Every, they read the book. The book is about modern Italy. We want to talk about modern Italy. So first they'll start, and they'll say, and I don't know what they're going to say about the book briefly. And then they'll bring up such something in the book that they they want to know more about. And uh, so we'll proceed like that. So basically, I'll answer their questions. Who wants to start? Do I start? Since you're looking at me. Um, journalists are um, very envious people. And before this started, Bevy was regaling me with stories of how well his book was had sold. And of course, I then hated it. <laughs> In America, not here. <laughs> um, so when I was reading the book, um, I was uh, more than usually skeptical. Journalists are supposed to be skeptical, so I was skeptical. I thought, uh, must look at this book with a very tough, hard eye. And then quite early on in the book, there's a, uh, a sentence which says, Italian invece è un labirinto, affascinante ma complicato. And I thought, tough, this is true everything. 
everything is fascinating and complicated. Every country is at least, what do you say exactly? So I'm all prepared for a book of stereotypes. And then on the next page, I read this uh, uh, sentence, which is, noi uh, giudichiamo i libri dal copertino. I politici da, da, dai sorrisi, i giornalisti dall'ufficio, le segretarie del portamento, le lampade dal design, le auto dalla linea, le persone dal titolo, non a casa, un italiano su quattro è presidente di qualcosa. <laughs> this, is, this is what everyone says about Italians, it's why is Betty doing this, these stereotypes. And then, bit by bit, I was drawn into the book. There's a, a, a lovely little bit just after that where Bebby describes himself meeting an, an aged lady, aged French lady, who had lost her cart in the airport and had to pick up a, a heavy suitcase, and he then helps her. And at the same time, he stands out for himself and says, Mentre Bebby compie questo gesto, se venire, osserva la scena dall'esterno e si congratula. Bebby accetta le contrazioni, Retributed as a stesso, is the Alantana Solisfato. <laughs> it's an interesting uh, idea that, that Italians are particularly self conscious about their own good acts. Although it is, of course, an infinite regression. When you think that Becky did this, he congratulates himself for doing it. And then, of course, he could congratulate himself for being critical about congratulating himself, <laughs> then congratulating himself about being critical for congratulating himself about being critical for congratulating himself, and so on, and in finite. But it is, it's a, it's a very funny one. And then, as I say, the book went on, he got, and I know Daniel wants to bring up some things, we'll, dis we'll discuss them as we go over it. I quickly lost the sense that here was a book which was playing on stereotypes. And, often, and between us, my wife was Italian and I often, think of each other's, the stereotypes of each other's country and bring them up. And there are very many. I mean, Italians stereotype Brits and Brits vice versa. We all stereotype other nations all the time. But this is much better than that. It's, it's a, a sharp observation that fits a journalist, but it's also at times thoughtful, uh, a, um, a real piece of observation by a very fine journalist. Well, thank you, um, Pepe, for inviting me again. I, I, just a few remarks to add to John's. It's always striking how you turn up the crowds, Pepe, wherever you go. Um, very loyal friend, but I think in particular loyal to, to your readers. You have a special relationship with your readers, and that's reflected in the... Um, well, everywhere you go around the world, but it's reflected certainly in this room today. I, I wanted to make one um, world premiere scoop announcement about this book. <laughs> Uh, and then three observations. The, the world premiere scoop announcement is that this is a failed, well, it's a murder mystery, but you wouldn't know it because in the original version of the book, which Becca kindly um, invited me to read, there was um, a lady in it called Nicole, who was Becca's muse, really, guiding him through, uh, well, he was guiding her through Italy, so it was partly his fantasy of taking a beautiful woman through Italy. <laughs> and uh, my constructive feedback on the book was, kill Nicole. <laughs> and much to my surprise, with some reluctance, eventually, indeed, Beppe did kill Nicole, and, and the result is that you have Beppe guiding you, not Nicole, through Italy, which I, I think is an improvement, Beppe. <laughs> Um, just three short remarks about the book. The first is, a, it's actually, as, as John says, it's, um, you think it's going to be a simple guide to the Italian mind, and it turns out, at least for the foreigner, to be ever more layers of complication. Not only the infinite regression of Beppe, but for the foreigner being guided to Italy, goodness, it's complicated. Every situation he puts you in, you suddenly realize it's not how it quite appears and you have to have all these layers of interpretation. So I thought Italy was a you know, fairly approachable place. And then you read this book and you realize that you understand nothing when two Italians at least are gathered together. The second, and again John made the point, it is a, a wonderful exercise in observation. My, my maternal grandparents were um, Italophiles to the nth degree, used to take every holiday in Italy. Particularly they enjoyed art museums and, and would tell me 
um, that you have to stand long enough in front of the picture until it starts speaking to you. <laughs> and Beppe has been standing in front of Italy for about half a century, and this book is the benefit of that patient observation of all sorts of different aspects of Italian life, and it's wonderful. The, the third remark is just that um, you shouldn't be misled by this book. It, it, it is covered, sugar-coated, if you like, as, as most of Beckett's writing is, with wonderful anecdotes and a great sense of humour, so you can have a real uh, entertainment and you can laugh <coughs> reading this book. But it is, deep down, I think, a very serious book, um, an examination of, of uh, Italy's soul. And in some senses, we could discuss this in the, in later, perhaps not even a very optimistic book. There are elements in it that are quite gloomy about Italy, I think, but always done with such style and humour in the better in the better mode that you wouldn't know it. So, um, you know, Venice is lovely, but it's sinking, and you have that same feeling. You actually make the something of the analogy at the end. So, I think that's perhaps for our discussion. Is is this um, an upbeat book about Italy, or fundamentally a a rather um, sad reflection in some ways of, of the state of Italy today? You British are unbelievable. In Italy, if you ask people to introduce you, they talk for half an hour each. <laughs> <laughs> and that's finito? And that's the way you do it? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Nicole, just one little point before we proceed about Nicole. Uh, another person that I trust, judgment, judgment, I trust very much, and uh, she's now in this room, is my wife, by the way. It, we've been married for 21 years today. So. <laughs> Women like this thing, right? <laughs> Men say, What is that? Why do you say that? Okay. Women know that I do. Because she forgets all the time about how we're wearing our heroes. So for me, it's the time to, but never had a chance to remind her behind the microphone in a crowded room. Okay, my wife Hortensia read the book and said the same thing. Say, Nicole, killer. But as a <laughs> having a young foreign. She could be British, she could be American, she could be German. You could sense that she was uh, from beyond the Alps. But, and, but I didn't trust her things. I said, maybe she's jealous or something of the people and things. And there was something about the beach. And I was telling Nicole about the, how important it is to study the Italian, how Italian undress on the beach. In advertising, they are completely naked. But on the beach, they undress more slowly and all that, but maybe, anyway. Uh, so the call has been killed. How do you want to do this? Uh, if you, is there anything in the book? I'm sure there is. Uh, I know there are a few points. So bring them up. Bro. Not this question, but like yeah. the, the first thing I want to bring up is an observation that you make about, um, about Tuscany. And in it, you say about, about Tuscany. And uh, you say, you, I mean, part of the book is based in Tuscany, and you say that, that Italians, or perhaps the Italian tourist industry, has a habit of doing what the Brits do with Scotland. That is, you, you, you pretend that it's all of Britain, because it's the most attractive part of Italy, or it's arguably the most attractive part of Italy, or at least, to, to, uh, since we have people here not from Tuscany, uh, is the one which foreigners often think is the most attractive part of Italy, and the one they go to most. The, the uh, impression is given that Italy is Tuscany. And uh, what I wanted you to talk a bit about that. What, how the, the true hands other than your own, the image of Italy is put abroad. Is it really Tuscan hill towns? Is that what we think of Italy? What do you think foreigners think of Italy? This book, I had to, not only to argue about Nicole, but then you and Artenso were well, right. I had to argue with my American publisher. The book was published in America in 2006. Uh, because I, I told them uh, that um, it's a Broadway book, it's, it's a double day random house. I told them, listen, I'm not going to write another Tuscany book. Don't worry, Beppe, we don't want another Tuscany book. Then they read the book and they said, oh my god, this is you know, trash Tuscany. You tell people that. Italy has got 19 other regions. <laughs> <laughs> so people have a fantasy, and they say, yes, I know. But I have enough 
of John of I walked into American bookstores as any writer should do before you know you, you, you explore your market you walk into an American bookstore oh in Britain is different we'll talk about that because you got the food obsession <laughs> To make it in Britain and America as a writer is really tough. As a, as a cook, a chef, a little easier. <laughs> I think it more... Anyway, I walked into American bookstores or, uh, or London bookshops, and what you have there, you have all the books are all the same. There is a red and white, and white tablecloth with checks. <laughs> you have a glass of white wine. You have an olive branch hanging on the table and a lemon hanging from the other branch because an american lady because that she's the real character of this book she's got a lot of personal problems she goes to italy and she really find italy the perfect place everything is solved immediately and she's not bothered with botanics who cares about lemon trees and olive and air as long as it's perfect and all she has is this beautiful fantasy of sipping white wine at sunset with a beautiful, good, a handsome young plumber <laughs> looking like George Clooney in uh, George, not now, George Clooney in his twenties. And what they do, they draw the the plumber and the um, and the lady, America, which she actually could be British. They talk about the meaning of life and how it is. <laughs> The fact is complicated, but um, don't, um, well, this only in Italian will get this. It's a little complicated by the fact that the hydraulic or plumber in Tuscan is called trombaio. <laughs> but uh, some people will not translate. Uh, I, I, just, I just didn't, I just didn't, it's true. <laughs> Ask the Tuscan. So I love Tuscany. I love the marketing of Tuscany. I respect the Tuscany ability. If American or British or the Dutch or the Germans, they want a nativity where, you know, the Tuscans are smart people. They say, what do you want me to do in a nativity? The fisherman, the, the shepherd, uh, you pay 10, you know, 9,000 pounds a week for a casale in Tuscany. I do whatever you want. <laughs> and rightly so. But I couldn't write the book. So we go through Tuscany, and I, and I actually explain that Tuscany is the kind of comforting beauty. It's a beauty that actually uh, leads you astray, in a way, because it's, everything looks perfect and simple. And I use actually Botticelli as a perfect example. Botticelli was a troubled man, had a troubled life, and the, and the Primavera, and it's called painting if you read it. If you do what your grandparents told you, if, if you wait for this beautiful girl to talk to you, she's not, you know, out of an advertising for a shampoo or something. It's, but Botticelli and Tuscany, there is something sim simply and deceiving about Italy. And so Tuscany is not the book I want to write, and I'm terrified, you know. Uh, I have to say the other, and I think my, the, the, the person in charge of the press, relay, press uh, office at She's here, we don't know each other yet, but I know she's in the room. They were braver because they actually didn't question the book. But the American publisher was really worried. They say, nobody is going to buy a book where you trash all the fantasy. And they said, a Dolce Vita is in Italy, John, you know that. But it's not an old, fading uh, movie memory. There is much more. A Dolce Vita is a certain way of living in Italy. We may go into that later. Not this, you know, aperitivo with hydraulico. By the way, we have real problem with the plumbers in Tuscany. You know, you have a problem with, it, with the, your tap, no one is going to fix it, because all the hydraulic plumbers in Italy are sipping white wine with <laughs> and charging a lot of money for that. They only talk about Kierkegaard or you know. <laughs> While we're on the geography, Beppe, what about the sun? Because, uh, you, you, you touch in Naples, and you. I remember when, when we were discussing the book, and I said uh, I would like to have a little bit of Sicily or more of the South, and you said Sardinia was the South, which sort of surprised surprised me. Is that is that right? <laughs> Sardinia is part of the South, uh, and I like Sardinia very much. I really want Sardinia to be part of the book because it's my, after Lombardy, it's probably the region that I know uh, best. Uh, well, the book is about Naples. There is something about Naples as well. Uh, 
And I've been, not accused is too much, but some people said it's too much, you're a northerner, and the book, it's, you know, are you sure you can write about uh, in the Italian mind? You know, are you sure that you can talk in the Neapolitan mind, and there is a Milanese mind, and there is a Sicilian mind? And I, well, my normal answer is that yes, you can. I think you have to go straight for the common denominator without being careful about stereotypes, but I think there is. I think Italians have got, and it's at the end of the book, that's a letter that my British friends write to me when they go back to London and they write a letter saying, well, we understand, and of course it's where they've been bombarding them with information, 10 days, 30 places, is that you Italians have got shortcomings, in a way, in a friends, I can say so, uh, that all start with an I, you are intelligent, too much, too much intimacy, too much ideology, too much intuition, paranormal, completely, <laughs> very dangerous for everybody. Uh, but also you've got quality to start with the G. You are gentle, you're generous, you're joyful, in Italy it's spelled with a G. <laughs> uh, and uh, you've got genius of transforming a crisis into a party. That's a classic <laughs> that's a de definition of Italian genius. So the I's and the G's, and I tell you what, I tell you about the South, it's pretty simple. The South is the G's and the I's times two. That's how I, I see it. And I, and I tell my friends, you know, whatever the good and the bad, it's whenever I go to Naples or to Southern Italy, it's, I can see all the fantastic qualities uh, like, you know, times two. It, it, exalted and are also the shortcomings of there and they are even more there. And I like the way that you say that uh, this ability to turn a crisis into a, a party means that you will have parties forever and a day because you have so many crisis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll do one more, John, and then you can ask the next. I wanted to ask you about food because you have this... First of all, I didn't realize it was quite as confusing as you mentioned that even the names of the the, the names of the meals differed by region. That was an, uh, an insight for me that what is pranzo in one place is colazione somewhere else, and this um, makes it very difficult. But why you explain that, for example, a restaurateur will choose to set, describe creamed vegetables in the menu <coughs> as veluttata di verdura di stagione al profumo di why, why do you need to do this when the food is so because wonderful? He, he can charge more. <laughs> Simple as that. Would you say, come on, 12 pounds, 12 euros for a cream of vegetable? Oh, yeah, 12 euros for blah, 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 12. <laughs> it's a cosmetic, the, the cosmetic side of food. That's it, that's one answer. Uh, but also, in Italy, food is becoming, uh, there are two sides of, of this. It's a long story, I'll make it very short. I think there is one good side of it, which is in Italy, Italians really know about the food. When we come here, sometimes we find it very nice, but also slightly funny the, how people get excited about food and wine. You can see all the excitement of the, of, how do you say neophyte in, in, in yeah. Italian? Neophytes, of the newcomers. You know, they're really excited about, but Italians haven't learned in the last, have, have not learned in the last 10 years. We've, we've known forever. An Italian knows if a pasta is good when, you know, like before he actually leaves the kitchen. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we we have a pasta which is not good because we love to complain, and that's very sophisticated. <laughs> but Italian really know, and the reason why Italian food was so popular around the world, and in London of all places you have an example, but I've been all over the world in the last three, four years, and, and Italian, that's a World Cup that we won against France. <laughs> The food one is a, cup, is a world championship that we won because the French, French have a great cuisine, but the one they export is a top one. 
we have a great cuisine, but the one we export and all the world imitate is the basic one. Italy, Italy food and cuisine is a great, is, I really admire Italy for that because it's a bottom-up operation. It's the food that actually was devised in the most extraordinary laboratory, which is the family. So you have 50 families coming to England, going to Belgium, to America, 49 will go to work in you know, ice cream factories, uh, you name it, and the 50th family would open a little place to cut it for all the others. And that was the, the, the seed of the Italian restaurants abroad. And the style is still that. And that's why the French, apart the wheat, Caterina de Medici taught them about everybody. <laughs> that's something that when Flammarion is going to publish this book, I have to work on that, on this bit of the, the presentation. But the, the French is different. They have great cuisine to travel around France. But the one they export, the French restaurants all over the world, is the top of the league. And uh, so I like Italy for being basic and simple. The, the not so good side of it is that eat food is becoming an obsession and is becoming one of the so-called piccoli piaceri, which are good, provided they don't become the only pleasures in life. And I'm afraid that food, uh, entertainment and uh, many other things in Italy are becoming the real obsession for, all, for too many people who don't have the sort of, these are the sort of the side dishes of my life. <coughs> it's becoming the only thing. The piccoli piaceri, the small pleasures are becoming the only pleasures. And that will worry me. That's how Venice folded basically at the end of the 18th century because it was fantastic. Great food, great great wine, a lot of sex. All of Europe was coming down to Venice at the end of the 18th century from the sex city of Europe. And uh, the FT magazine on Saturday wrote about that. Did you see that wonderful yes. cover? The feminist, the land the feminists left behind. So what worries about me, uh, what worries me about food is the fact that we Talk too much about that for someone is becoming an obsession. If you take people of our generation, a third are becoming gardeners, which is something that in Italy people wouldn't do. In Britain, yes, but not in Italy. A third are taking a bicycle and draw and, and they, are, they are everywhere with a bicycle all over the place. People in their fifties. And the other third are obsessed with gourmet cuisine. You know, Italian libido is taking strange ways in environments. Well, I, I, I mean, you described the fall of uh, Venice with uh, good food, lots of wine and sex. It sounds pretty good to me. I mean, it's a hell of a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to also bring up Venice in another context. Venice is probably where newspapers began, where our trade, trade of food has fallen more or less um, began because it was a great trading city. And it, we imagine the Venice you see, it was a place which in late medieval, and uh, Renaissance times was in some ways the center of the world in central trade routes, and therefore you needed information, and with information you began to get newspapers. And so Italy can claim that one of its great cities invented the newspaper. I remember when I first met, first time I met you was in Russia, uh, when I, where I was based for some years, and we were there for a bit. And about absurdly, in a country which was going through a paroxysm, so we talked about Indra Montanelli. Uh, whom I haven't come across them, whom you, I think, um, worked for for some time, who I think was to some extent uh, um, a, a patron of yours. Uh, the book is dedicated to um, Now, and Daniel's magazine has had quite a lot to do with this, um, part of the image of Italy is of a country where the media not necessarily gone wrong, but has become so intermixed, so intertwined with politics especially, obviously, in the figure of Silvio Berlusconi, but even more generally, where uh, the people who control the press, the people who, or the person who controls the commercial television, and even the state, which controls the three towns of Rai, have, um, to some extent, gone astray, where the, the, <coughs> the media there don't do the job that um, they should do. They don't do the job properly, of holding power to account. Now, uh, you read again. Holding power. Holding power to account. You think that's the job of the media? Yeah. 
Most Italians don't think that way. Very That's right. the Maybe. answer to my question. To your question. Explain, explain it. I, you know that I totally agree with this, and I've been uh, writing passionately with the economists, with no byline, with that the rule about the subject, this subject, when um, Mr. Berlusconi was our prime minister. But I haven't been more uh, f forgiving with other problems. I, I work for a newspaper, Corriere della Sera, which was owned basically by bank and big, big business. And I really don't envy the people writing in the business section of the Corriere della Sera, I have to be honest. And La Repubblica has got its own problems. And let alone in Giornale, who is a party newspaper, of course. It's uh, the, le the left, same thing. But what you say, I agree, because I've been living too long in this country and in America, and probably I've, I've been exposed too much for my own good, John. To a system, and I feel sometimes, and I think quite a few people in this room, when they'll go back home, they'll realize, or oh, Occhio, you will be cool. <laughs> they'll feel strangers at home. Because to you, to me, to, jo to Daniel, and to many in this room, it's obvious what the. Yes, hold power to account. Accountability is not easy to translate in Italy. Of course, to do this, you must explain. You must uh, entertain sometimes, why not? You must, uh, uh, otherwise people won't read what you do, but the basic job of the media is that. But in Italy, people will question that. People will say that it's not true. And I have, sitting behind a table like this, with Italian journalists, good ones, who actually say, no, you're wrong. It's an hypocrisy. You've been to London too long. It, the media is another way to find political battle. And it's much better if you declare I am I belong to the right to the right. Uh, and and on the left people say, and then from this clash some kind of truth will come out. I think this is bullshit, to be honest. I think the job our job is far too important and, and, but that's the way it is. And I think it's uh, the moment you have an, a nation that do not you is a country of food. Food that is a competence and a real wisdom that comes from century. And, and by history is not the only explanation. It's come from century, it's come from family tradition, it's come from acquired sense. People about food don't say silly things, they have a real knowledge. About the media and politics is like we have the same confused excitement that you British have about food. How about that? <laughs> well, it's interesting that when you when you, when you describe even complicated subjects like that, you often resort to comparisons from outside. So you you compare the, the parallels between between Britain and, and Italy. And this book is called An Insider's Guide to the Italian Mind. Um, your, many of your previous books, probably most of your previous, previous books, have been about being an outsider and observing, well, notably this country in English, in and, and, and Americans, um, with your book about your year in, in America. So, obviously, it's not so easy to be an insider, it's easier, a more privileged position to be an outsider looking in. How did you manage to be an insider looking in? You had to put yourself on the outside a little bit, yes? Correct. But I didn't have to put myself, my life was a bit like that. Uh, in, uh, uh, first of all, it, I, I really like this the subtitle, An Insider's Guide to the Italian Mind. That is the British publisher's choice. Because the American subtitle was a field guide to the Italian mind. Because every country has got it's interesting. By the title and the cover illustration, you know what basically different countries think about Italy. The German one was was a funny one. It took me a month to learn it. Yes. You believe in Italian or if I rate to be or if I have to that. I'll translate. Although I know you all speak German, but it's uh, surviving in Italy without uh, uh, getting married, uh, being run over by a car, <laughs> or being arrested. <laughs> yeah, that's it. In Russia, it's Italia Vsegdama Ladaia Signora. 
a forever young lady or whatever. And um, so every country has got this own idea. But insider, I I like. It was a, it was the toughest book to write. Uh, in this room, there is a friend of mine who translated my first book into English, uh, Inglesi, is now called an Italian Britain with the same book, which I many years ago I was sitting here explaining, and I don't really remember that well at that time, but I translated it and she knows that that book in a way was easier to easy to write. Because for me, five years in Britain, uh, I knew Britain well enough to write a book, but it was really, I was still an outsider. Young Italian with black hair. <laughs> La verbio facile, how do you say that? Uh, the American one, it was different. I was in America for only a year and a half, but I've been to America since I was 20, back and forth for a different reason. And again, it was an outsider job, easy. This one was painful at times. Uh, it's not, I mean, if you write a book about your own country, and this is going to be, I'm going to write another one about Italy, I don't think. Uh, if you write about your own country, and you write a book which is only funny, it means you're stupid. This book is, is a letter d'amore. It means a bitter love letter to my country. But it's a love letter. I love my country. And, I, and sometimes it drives me crazy. Italy drives everybody crazy. It's a country that drives you into ecstasies and into rage in 10 minutes and 100 yards. You go into a square in Italy, now July, 9.30 in the evening. Uh, in Siena, you remember that, Julia, when they point young, you go into a, a square, you look at Italian boys and girls talking to each other, drinking but not too much, looking, not, not throwing up against the wall, not, uh, not fighting. Well, no, they have fun. They have fun because they... Don't throw up their fun. <laughs> no, 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 Italians, you know why, I know you are, I know you are scherzando, I know you're joking, but you know why Italians, the only reason the explanation of Italian Latin lovers, because at a certain point in the European summer night, the only one who are awake at midnight are the Italians. We have no competition. This poor Britain and Finnish and German girl, what should I do? Go and wake up their compatriots and say, that they go for it. An Italian young man who's drunk on a couple of, uh, of glasses of white wine and is fully alert. <laughs> That's the, the explanation of Latin lovers and the reason of our success. <laughs> anyway, let's go. You are in Italian Square. It's so beautiful. And uh, the, the summer night in Italy is the time that this country is paradise. Then you go and, and you go back to your car and you find a San Moron that's got a sparky sky in second fila, lots of car inside, and you cannot go anywhere. And you think, I hate this country. This country drives me crazy. How is that possible? So what is Italy? Italy is a beautiful, uh, heavenly square, or is a stupid man who, who because mostly it's a man, I have to say, <laughs> who locked you inside. To write about your own country, Daniel, you have to cover all of this, and that to the way to hide your rage or your disappointment with humor, but also to hide your passion and your, your sort of longing for Italy, which is not as successful as it should be. That's what really... And, but you have to cover that with humor too. So I use humor to cover all my feelings, and I think it's what maybe a writer should do, otherwise you become simply and die back. <laughs> One of the things that, um, that when you're discussing is that uh, you discuss our mutual countries with the Italians. I quite often feel that, that the affection, the mutual affection, which I think British and Italians do feel, I mean, I'm quite often struck by Italians who don't particularly like the French. It seems to be a kind of Italian thing, but not particularly liking the French. But most Italians would say they like the British. But most British would say they like the Italians. They may well have stereotype views about each other, but it seems to be a mutual affection. And I sometimes think it's the affection of not necessarily opposites, but people who are quite different, who are formed rather differently. And you could say it's the difference between a Protestant culture, which is no longer particularly strong in this country, as a religion, but certainly as strong as a memory, and a Catholic culture. 
And sometimes also it seems to me that what we've got, uh, the argument between us, as it were, is between um, uh, people who see Brits, who see Italians as quite cynical, and the Italians who see the Brits sometimes as being rather naive. It may actually adhere to the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic culture. I sometimes feel, I get the feeling uh, that in Italy there's a kind of a knowingness underneath the, what you call it at one point, the kind of the, the indiscipline of it. There's a kind of a knowingness about human nature, which is rather different from, if you like, the, the British culture. And um, which may have come from being um, a much more civilized culture, much more early, may have come from a kind of view of the world which has been mediated through, through a much more powerful religion and still is, may come from a variety of things. I wondered if you saw that as between, if you like, the Anglophone world, the Presbyterian Protestant world, goes and Mudder, and the Catholic world, above all the Italian world. That's a tough one. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, what you said, I've just been in Germany for one and a half book tours. So five cities, and I spent all of June uh, last year in Germany. Uh, it's a workout. Yeah. I just want to make you... Yeah, it's a, you know, I, but you have to wear it because Milano has No, I have to wear it because, number one, I want to show that we can transform a crisis into a party. That's in the example last day we went to the workout with the most disgusting Italian scandal we transformed into. It. But the first time, in 82, the same thing happened. We need a scandal. In Italy, you need an emergency. You need an exception. We are, in Germany, I was saying, you know, we are Ausnahme country. So we really need to have an exception. Otherwise, you know, uh, you probably remember the Pontignano when uh, Lord Darnell really like he asked me a similar question, non region, I will go into that in a second. Say, okay, can you sum up the difference between an Italian and uh, an Italian and the uh, and the Brit? And I uh, and I say, you all you have to do is to go and you know fly out Italia or British Airways to <laughs> Italy, and you see the difference. The, the steward asked for British Airways, and it's actually the beginning of the book. She's fantastic in the, uh, she smiles, she asks you, is everything all right, and coming from your back when you're eating, and, uh, and she, but she's got sensible shoes, she's not probably not as pretty and everything, but she's great in the, the, the ordinary administration, the regular, if there is an exception, she's probably annoyed, she looks at you and says, you spoil coffee in your lap, what are you doing, you know, you're 50. <laughs> the Italian is exactly the same. Uh, they're exactly the opposite. The Italian lady, she finds the regular word boring, basically. <laughs> but if something strange happens, she she really likes that. She can show she's bright, she's resourceful, she does things that she, you don't expect her to do. That's it. How you can sum up the two countries. But how do you bring religion into that? I think, in a way, the real, it's not a problem, but the, if I had to pick one thing that really sort of sets us, us apart, is forgiveness. In a way, in Italy, we are convinced that forgive, we, our, we are so wary of authority, of all kinds, of rule, of regulation, that we are so wary of the, of the fairness of the people in power that we want forgiveness to be built somehow inside the system. Uh, we want, call it amnesty sometimes, call it condono, call it the fact that even if you do something as silly as drinking too much, driving and having an accident, and that's exactly what people are talking in these last 48 hours in Italy. We had a few, a series of accidents. I've been writing about that in Corriere today. It's a scandal. And it's in, but the idea of having, you know, put, you know, you do that, you go, in, you go to jail. You know, the Americans put Paris Hilton to jail, and she didn't even run over a young, a, a young person. Why she shouldn't do the same? The Italians are averse. If you want television saying, I do believe that if you drink and drive, and if you 
drive too fast, even before you run over a young man or a young woman, you should be spend a night in jail, be trial, put on trial the next morning, your license taken away. Italia, you will have 95% of the country against you. They call you justizialista. That's a cl classic term. That means you, you, you really want law and order and rule to be applied. We want forgiveness to be built in. And it's a very Catholic thing. The idea that whatever happens, it's forgiveness is, is part of the deal. Which is, of course, if you are just someone who gets it wrong sometimes, is right. But knowing that many people behave in a certain way because they know they'll get away with it. And I don't think in many other cultures that happens. But is, this, is this entirely linked to, your, I mean, you're very interesting in the book about this Italian application of individual rules in, in each situation. I mean, the traffic light is the classical uh, example that you give, that every approach to a traffic light is not really a a stop or a go, it's a, an opportunity for, it, for, for, for sort of internal debate and decision about what, the, what that particular traffic light means. But I mean, at the same time, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, it sort of speaks to the intelligence that you talk about, which, that every situation is a philosoph philosophical moment, but it makes life terribly complicated. But yes. I want to just add before you go on, when Zanami brought up traffic, um, there's a nice piece, I'd probably find it very common, where you where um, pedestrian crossings, which I think are relatively recent in Italy, and it's, it's very true that pedestrian crossings there are, are a real battlefield. <laughs> you, you, you bring up this figure of the pedestrian, who by and large does not trust the, the cars to stop. In Britain, people, people launch themselves on pedestrian crossings in front of trucks and, and expect them, nearly always with success, to stop. <laughs> in Italy, you describe it, it's absolutely correct. The people sort of sidle up to pedestrian crossing, it's extremely gingerly, a good of fruit out of the hand, and nobody stops. And then perhaps one guy stops, and the people behind him almost pass it. Stupid bastard. It's, it's a, it's a, it, that, too, I think, is a difficult part. It, it, it speaks to a kind of thing which I think all foreigners would understand about the British, and certainly Italians do, which is the the habit of apologizing. People say sorry when you tap on their toes. Uh, people apologize in this country. Our culture is, is terribly apologetic. And I think when we meet a culture like, like the Italian, or indeed the French, or most other cultures, where people you know, do what they do and then defend it. I'm doing this, I'm crossing this pedestrian crossing and get that out of the way. It's a, it's a different approach. But, well, the pedestrian crossing is a good example. Uh, you brought up the red light. Uh, I could mention fiscal behavior, <laughs> tax behavior. And that's, you know, it's the same subject. Queuing. We, uh, queuing. Well, queuing is different. We're learning. Because <laughs> it's, you know, it's actually so difficult. Everybody is so professional in avoiding queues. It used to be. And we all realized that it was so exhausting to fight against each other with jockeying for position that you may well just stay there. <laughs> you described how Italians at the bank managed to be in two queues at once. Well, that's, that's something else. But that's an easy one. Because if you have like, two, what is, two windows, if you, if you don't queue, you queue in the middle. Uh, you maximize your chances. So no one, and you have the, the foreigners who comes in and say, oh, there's no one here. You go straight to the wind and say, oh, what are you doing? We're queuing here. Yeah. Yeah, you queue. You're queuing in front of a wall. That's what we do. Uh, the, but you see, traffic light, pedestrian crossing, taxes, many other, is always the same story. We, want, we have a, a rule. And we want to decide if that rule applies to our personal circumstances then and in that very moment. It can noon, here and now. Uh, if you ask someone who's you know, driving like a madman in an autostrada, I would actually, it was an officer from Carabinieri who told me, say, you really should come with me. 
I we stop them. If you stop here, you know, the limit is 130 kilometers an hour. We, these people are, 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 are driving 190, 200, you stop them. In, Brit in America, they will go down and say, officer, my fault, do whatever you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Probably they'll do something similar here. They just say, oh my god, you know, sorry, whatever, but you know, I really don't want it, but you know, what but uh, Anyway, that's the same thing. Uh, in Italy, they just go down and say, listen, <laughs> I know what you're thinking, that was coming too fast, and the officer said, yes, that's exactly what you were doing. Not too fast, like, I should take away your license, your car, your whatever, you know, just, of all of these, you can end your wife, just take her away, and that's all. No, he says, this person comes out of the car, and I listen. And he goes into the most extraordinary explanation. <laughs> he was late for something vital. And the car, these modern cars are so safe that if you are driving 100 kilometers an hour with a BMW, it's actually safer than driving 130 with a Fiat. And then the, the, the human eye cannot catch the actual speed of the moving object. And the fact that... And he said, when I listen to this man, the way... The way he, he drives, I just should put Strain into jail. The way he talks, he deserves a university chair. <laughs> you know, he, he can pick the subject, you know. And the same is tax evasion. If you someone here, someone, a jeweler. Jewelers, I'm sorry if anybody here is, is, uh, has got jewelers in the family, but it's a fact that they declared last year 11,000 euros gross as a yearly salary. So uh, in Italy, the only country with jewelers are actually poor. The policemen, teachers, and everybody. Anyway, if you ask, he won't tell you, listen, I make a lot of money, I can do it, I know how to do it, who cares? No, he wants to explain you that the tax norm should be interpreted that in fact is so much better instead of giving money to the state who's going to waste it, it's so much better to put it straight back into the economy <laughs> as the Chicago school would say namely in the car sector because he's got the same huge <laughs> BMW and, and you listen to him and you say, is this man serious? and he is <laughs> he is so in front of a rural regulation to be a prime minister of Italy is like to be the shepherd instead of sheep you got cats try it <laughs> <laughs> but Beppe since you're talking about cars the fact that the Chico Cento is now relaunched yeah. successfully must be a moment of optimism for it yes it is and I'm glad in fact the Chico Cento is a couple of uh, and you read the book twice I'm afraid for the Daniel the Chico Cento is in the book <laughs> the Cinquecento is in the book. The Cinquecento is a perfect example. And when we Italians keep things simple, we are, I think, not, it's not never good to say the best in the world, but we are just so good. Everything that is simple in Italy, food, when it's simple, is great. Cars, when it's simple, is great. Vespa, so is it, is it baroque? that puts it, us into trouble. <laughs> but Cinque Cento is a perfect example. If being a journalist, let me add that. Uh, I think it's good, but I, I hope that the Cinque Cento, there was so much hype in the Italian media, which I, when I read and listened and heard that, I thought it was good, but it was becoming a little dangerous. I believe, and I told one of the one of the Agnelli, one of the old Agnelli, is actually Umberto, a Pontignan, years ago. We were sitting next to each other, and he was asking me, what do you think about fear in the media? I told them they were too powerful for their own good. Now fiat is not that powerful in Italy anymore. But there is a kind of automatic, reflesso automatico, automatic. And the way this was covered by the Italian media, there was not a hint of a of a criticism anywhere, they were like, and it's not good. When fiat, part of the problem with fiat is that the moment they produce really silly cars, and they did in the last few, it happened. The Chico Cento was launched in 92, was an, someone remembers the Chico Cento? It was an it was like a little monster. 
But no, no one had the guts to write or say on television, to write in the newspaper, listen, this is not the way to redo the Cinquecento. No one did. This is the way to redo the Cinquecento, which is a little jewelry. It's true. But it's good and important that Italians do not write and talk about fear the way they did. Otherwise, fear will never understand. Because not only the media is a way of holding power to account, but also to holding business to account. And that we failed to do spectacularly this fiat in the last 10, 15 years. You, um, you're very good on, on piazzas and bars. Um, there's a section in the book where you describe, you, you quote, you read a record on the bar. You, you say, in Bartaliano, in the post of the Lundi Soste, on the Club Inglese, and I have a lot of the passati, a lot of the mercato chinese. In the post of the Vendor Espresso, se ti vi è un affare o una serata, l'inizio di una collaborazione o la fine di un amore. E mi chiede spesso le emozioni, my phrases, le emozioni verticali non ci spaventano. And then you talk of uh, the piazza, le piazza raccontano, infatti non bisogna lasciarli il tempo di parlare. Do you think that, I mean, that's what, again, what many foreigners see as charm, that many foreigners who go out for some holiday now for what time to sit around and, and have coffee and enjoy the piazzas. Do you think, though, that is, after all, that Italy, from where the slow food movement came, um, that there is something still in Italian culture which may be unique, which may adhere to it, particularly more than any other in the world, which is an ability to slow down, and which has preserved a kind of public sociability, which Certainly in the Brits and the, probably the Germans, the Northern Europeans, perhaps uh, others as a whole. Is that something you would say is particularly Italian, or is that other stereotype? Right? Who on the football field? <laughs> what? The ability to slow down and speed up. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a, a good example. Well, it's, uh, if you think about it in the bar, the way you described it, it's, uh, it's a contradiction because in uh, like in the German cultures from Austria to Germany to Hungary, which, uh, Hungary which is not German but it was influenced by that, people even here, people to have a coffee they sit down. In Italy we don't. Our digestive tract is not built for that. We need to be standing up. And often I'm sure we have all the Italians in this room have tried it. When we travel abroad and we want to have, you know, we are in a rush, we want to drink our coffee standing up, they look at us and say, These people want to save and not to, not to pay for their for <laughs> service or something. In fact, we really like the idea. What can I say? It, yes, it is still the case, but it, it has to be detected carefully. It's not that Italian, Italian work hard, too hard. Not as hard as the Americans, but they have something that they consider like holidays and time with the friends and, uh, and dinners of a certain way, and even lunches. There is a time for, for slowing down in Italy, which is important. I think that public life in Italy is so unnerving in many ways, and I'm afraid it's not really improving, that you really need time to unwind, can I say that? I think that you really, if you live in Rome, if you work in Rome, you need an evening with your friend in a terrazza. I call it, I call it a terrazza room. You know, where you get you, everything, you sort of evaporates. Not everything, but some of it. And so the next morning you're ready to fight again. I think that an Italian public life and a Norwegian weather we would have at least three revolutions in the last <laughs> century. Yes. Well, 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 one of the sanctuaries that you describe is, is actually the Italian home, the apartment, which is where you, you, you retreat outside this public battlefield. And you're, you're a seasoned observer of the Italian apartment, but also the British home. And then the, I think you cite statistics of how uh, the, the area that Italians live in compared with the area of homes that British live in. Does that explain a lot about the differences in character, the physical space in which we live as two different cultures? Well, it does. It's 
from the uh, if you start from the outside the way Italian gardens are walled Guantanamo actually is being modeled <laughs> on an Italian villetta. Uh, it's, you know, it's, I don't know against who, but it's like the idea of protecting yourself, your family, or whatever, not wanting your, this, the more you go south, that it happens, not only in Italy, but in the world. The southern people want to have walls to protect whatever it is on the, uh, but also in, uh, what really struck me, is in the real difference is that Italians can put up with a with a chaotic street outside, but not with with uh, with uh, lack of order inside their homes. And in Britain, it's a bit of the opposite. In fact, my wife and I we lived here when we, uh, when we got married twenty one years ago today. On uh, we came we went on the Trans Siberian train to Beijing, and then from Hong Kong back to London to live here. And I think my wife has been in London too long, uh, when she was very young. And in fact, our house often looks like a, the house of my British friends, and I complain. But she say, she say, they are wiser than us. Don't worry, this is not important. Read a book, which is more important. Shut up. <laughs> and she's probably right. Uh, I mean, the, uh, one of the old stereotypes of Italy that I'm afraid is that um, it's a big family. Close family, lots of kids, grandparents there, um, a nuclear family which would be complex as many as 20 people. No longer. Italians have perhaps the smallest families in, in Europe. And that's an enormous change. It's not an enormous change in a very short time. Not the last 20, 30 years. It's gone from uh, a big family country to a very, very small family country, to the point where it isn't reproducing itself and, and will suffer from that in the next 10, 20, 30 years. What, what do you think has been the effect of that? I mean, do you see, you mentioned several times in the book, a, a sea change in the families? Are they much less close? Uh, are we living through, is Italy living through a revolution in family life? Yes and no. I think that first there is a why it happened. Uh, why Italians are not producing uh, children the way they used to. Uh, you probably have read and heard a lot about that. And I think Italy and Spain are a good signal of that. I think there are mainly two reasons. One is, is the same for Italy and Spain, which, as you probably know, are the, have the lowest, what's called, what, what is the, the fertility rate of. Uh, is that uh, young women are now working, being successful, they, they start careers much, much more the way, exactly the way that the Northern European counterparts do. And so the time when you sit down, no, you don't sit down, you do something else. Let's say, but, and you decide, we'll produce a child, uh, okay, with your partner, husband, you whatever. We change three times a name, it was Dico, Pax Dico now is Cus, you know that? The new name of the couple, the unmarried couple which is together and protected by the law. The new brand new one is Cus, which to me was Centro Universitario Sportivo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The moment you decide a woman now in Italy is probably a little over 30, and I can see quite a few in this room and they know I'm right. A while years ago it was like in your early 20s when you would take that decision. Number two is that everybody, men and women, men and women boys and girls, are actually have a good time. Italy is a joyful country, it's a country where the Dolce Vita is not an old memory, as I said, but it's there. So to be a young man or a young woman who in one of the great peace cities in Italy, Pavia, which you know well, Parma, Piacenza, Padova, it's great. So you want to, pro to extend that period as much as you can. Then, and then finally the fact that people, especially young men, live with their parents too long. And if you live with your parents, I think 70% of Italian males over 30 live with their parents, which is absolutely shocking. And how can you produce a child 
if your parents are watching people babble next door, <laughs> you need to concentrate. Uh, this sounds like a joke, but there is a lot of truth in it. There is the reason. Uh, extended family, yes, uh, but look, it, Italy love families. If you love being together, Italians have, that's a good thing I like about culture. I could see my, there are exceptions. Here we got one. People I can see they are very well at ease and happy with their parents and grandparents. But many of my British friends are not at ease. They found something not unhealthy but strange of being a grown up and being and seeing often their old parents. Uh, uh, like, you know, in Italy it's perfectly natural to, to have three generations for Sunday lunch, for holidays. And that's a good thing, and I think that I like if you don't bring it too far. And so it's. Um, so we should uh, we should end. So we have one more question for each of us. I'm going to add one very quick question, which is, Pepe, you you you, you are a food fascist. <laughs> a food what? Uh, well, it's a dangerous <laughs> word here. But, uh, so I would just say, a food fascist. Fascist, yes. In that you 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 say that it is absolute. It's a cardinal sin to. Uh, have a cappuccino after about 11 o'clock. <laughs> after what? <laughs> so my, my, my question is, is, is it right that you, you've exported all this food to us poor foreigners? You've exported cappuccino, latte, whatever. Uh, and, and you've, you, you've exported the pizzas and the pastas and everything, and then you tell us we can't eat them how we want to. <laughs> uh, very easy answer. 11 o'clock is the is deadline for cappuccino in the winter. In the summer, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning, a cappuccino is immoral and illegal. <laughs> Illegal, in, immoral, immoral. It's, and uh, I said this in America, and they told me, uh, well, if, if uh, restaurateurs, Italians say, if our customers want a cappuccino after dinner, what shall, you, shall we do? And I told them, just don't give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> you have to educate people. <laughs> <laughs> they want them to have a chain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, and uh, I like to read, or take, one minute, but I like to read just the tea. Uh, we've been serious at the moment, and I'm, and I'm glad that we tackled some of it from the media to politics to morality. But there is 10 little advice that I give to my uh, foreign friends when they <coughs> leave Italy and they're very fast. And I like to read them to you, and they are. And in a way, they sum up most of the things we said. Uh, actually, it's a letter they write to me, and they say, here are some of the things we learn on our 10-day trip with you. Number one, you can trust the restaurateur's advice and professional skills during your meal. Let's show what he put, puts on the bill. <laughs> Two, you can have a glass of wine with your lunch, and no one will think you are an alcoholic. <laughs> Three, before dinner, the hostess may wait for 10 or 15 minutes before she offers you a drink. That doesn't mean she hates you. <laughs> Four, never leave more than 10 inches in front of you in a line of five meters on a motorway. Otherwise, some joker will slip in. Five, roadside hoardings billboards are dangerous. It's not just possible to observe Italian undress and Italian traffic at the same time. <laughs> Six, pedestrian crossings are there for decoration only. <laughs> Seven, in Italy, motorists, small children, priests, and good-looking women do whatever they want. <laughs> Eight, don't be surprised if private gardens have no edges. Italians prefer Guantanamo-style gates. <laughs> Nine, in Italy, everybody's hands speak English. <laughs> Ten, some Italians will fall over themselves to convince you that they are all their all-time best friends for this week. If you believe them, that's your business. <laughs> Eleven, none of the preceding rules is universally valid. If Italians realize that a foreigner knows the ropes 
they just make up some new rules. <laughs> okay, and uh, this is for the English book, so thanks to my publisher, but, but, but here and now, thanks to John and to Daniel to go and, you know, to uh, my friend has got a new book, it's an uh, atto coraggioso, bravery. Thank you very much and thank you. Beppe Severnini a Londra all'Istituto Italiano di Cultura. Una domanda. Perché per alcuni italiani, giovani italiani, ancora Londra sembra essere un Eldorado? Dopo tutte le cose che ho detto e che voi avete filmato, hai ancora il coraggio di farmi una domanda? È poi una domanda così impegnativa, però sono buono oggi, poi è il mio anniversario di nozze, quindi ti rispondo. La risposta è che Londra dà una sensazione di movimento, di novità, e di progresso, che non è necessariamente progresso sempre positivo, ma di qualcosa che si muove sotto i piedi. Lo stesso vale per una città come Berlino, dove sono appena stato, eh, e un ragazzo italiano ha, la, ha bisogno di questa sensazione di essere su un nastro trasportatore, di andare da qualche parte. L'Italia è bella, ma la sensazione troppo spesso è che non ci si muove, il nastro trasportatore, il tapirulan è fermo. Questa non è una bella cosa, i ragazzi lo intuiscono, vengono qua e dicono sì, mi piace vengono con un bagaglio mentale pesante, si ritrovano la testa leggera dopo un po' di tempo. Se non è per la birra, ma è per il piacere di stare qui, mi sembra che vada bene. Ciao.